Hello, I'm K. Steve, and welcome to a new math video. This is for Algebra 2. This is uh, a realization that because I taught Algebra 2 a couple years that I, I probably have the majority of notes already made up that I can just put into video form and share with you and hopefully help some people out. So this first lesson discusses domain range and end behavior, but actually I think even more importantly discusses how to uh, write intervals. So let's take a look at that and see what's going on. So the idea of this is that in math we're going to want to have a way to talk about a, a set of numbers or a range of numbers or a domain of numbers. We're going to want to be able to say the numbers from here to here are a part of our answer or are, are a part of something. They have some quality about them. And so we have to be able to kind of universally write those so that other people can understand. <laughs> Ironically, because I'm talking about having a universal way to write them, we actually have three ways. So if you have not already and would like to, I have a notes page over on my website, Case of Math, and I'll link it here so that you can go and download it and print it if you'd like to so that you have less writing to do. And now I'm going to assume that if you wanted to do that, you've done it and start talking about what I'm going to fill in this blank here. An interval is a part of a number line without any breaks. We can write an interval using three types of notation. So this word interval is just talking about um, kind of a section of something. And we might use the word interval in our, in our daily life to talk about, you know, there was an interval of time where I didn't play video games. I mean, that's not true for me, but maybe for you that's true. There was an interval of time where we didn't have power because the power went out. We can talk about a section of something, right? Um, or maybe there's an interval of time each day that you choose to do math, and that would be a really cool interval to have. But in math, we tend to talk about these intervals as an interval of maybe x values or y values or, or some sort of values that we could represent on a number line if we wanted to. We don't always, but... We could represent this interval on a number line. Um, we also will see that graphs, uh, like on the coordinate plane, play a part in intervals as well. So we have three different ways that we can write out our intervals so that other people will understand what we're trying to say. And the first way should be familiar to you from Algebra 1 and Algebra 2 when you've talked about solving inequalities. In fact, the notation is inequality notation. The inequality notation involves you using whatever letter you're talking about, like x, and using an inequality such as less than or equal to, and a number to show uh, what you're talking about. So the inequality x is less than or equal to 5 is saying whatever we're talking about, whatever we're describing, is only true for numbers that are either 5 or less than 5. The next notation is called set notation. And this notation is really similar to inequality notation, but it adds some fanciness is what I like to think of it as. This is the kind of notation that you are more likely to see if you end up pursuing a math degree or doing, um, you know, math that is really proof heavy and things like that. Because there's a part of set notation that we can be more descriptive with than we can with just inequality notation. So set notation, we start off with a squiggly bracket, which, that's a decent squiggly bracket. It's definitely something that takes practice, I think, to make good squiggly brackets. Um, and then we write down what letter we're talking about. So if I'm trying to write x is less than or equal to 5, I would write x. Or if I was using y, I'd write y. And then I make a vertical line. This vertical line in math uh, is supposed to mean such that. And so what we're doing whenever we're writing things in set notation is we're actually using a shorthand to explain a situation to other people. So this is saying that we have x such that, and then we're going to put the inequality that we're talking about. And then we're going to close our set notation. So in this case, set notation is saying we have x such that x is less than or equal to 5. 
and especially when you compare them right next to each other, set notation may seem a little bit silly. But because if you do go on in math a lot later, um, and where set notation is used more, it, it's helpful to see it now in a kind of easier setting. All right, the final way that we notate is called interval notation. Uh, which is kind of funny since we're talking about intervals and it's called interval notation. And this is one of my, this is probably my favorite way to do it because um, once you get the hang of it, I think it is the easiest to write. So interval notation uses parentheses and a comma, kind of like a point does, or it could use brackets and a comma, and those will mean different things. But the idea is that instead of it talking about a point, what it's talking about is the range of numbers that are true for whatever our interval is. So if we're talking about x is less than or equal to 5, we're saying that it can be any number that's less than or equal to 5. So we would say, well, my interval is that I can be from uh, negative infinity, so we'd put negative infinity first, and then we'd put five because that's as far as our interval goes and the difference between putting parentheses and brackets notates whether we're equal to or not so since we're equal to five we put a bracket around it and we're going to practice this a bunch that's going to be kind of the first part of this lesson um, so if this is like i don't know what you did there we're gonna we're gonna see more and hopefully you'll you'll be able to pick up what's going on as we go through our examples I promise this is the last time I'll say it, but you should really consider going to my website and downloading the notes page to use to write these down instead of having to draw them yourselves. I mean, I guess alternatively you can just watch and try to absorb, but there is evidence that taking notes along with the person doing the math is helpful in the long run. So we are going to practice using each of these notations for some intervals shown and, and represented by number lines. And this is going to hopefully refresh our memories on inequalities, help us understand how to convert the inequality into set notation, and then it's going to give us a chance to see how interval notation works. In pre-calculus, which is your next class, um, where you use, you have to describe things in intervals quite a bit, or in calculus where you may see the same thing, you're not going to be asked always to do all three of these things. Anytime that in math you're asked to write it all three of these ways, it's just the person who designed the question wanting you to practice writing it in these three ways. If we actually just wanted to talk about whatever the interval is, we'd pick which way we want and we'd go with it. And sometimes teachers have a preference that they want you to use. So for instance, when I'm in pre a pre-calculus teacher, my preference is interval notation because I think that it is the one that is the most useful, um, but other people might disagree, or uh, it's not like if I didn't specify what kind of interval I want you to use, it's not like I would count it wrong if you used a different type of notation, but just keep in mind that only while we're learning about this stuff are we gonna write it down these three different ways, which can feel really repetitive and annoying. All right, so looking at this number line, we have a, an open circle at four, which if you remember what open circles mean, they mean not equal to. And then our graph is shaded red to the left. So that means this interval is talking about all the numbers that are less than four. And we're not told if this is an X or a Y number line, or so we typically just assume it's an X number line, just because we, I mean, we like using, by this point in our math lives, we probably like using X because it's familiar. So our inequality is going to just be x is less than 4. And that's, you know, that should be reminiscent kind of of Algebra 1. And uh, not Algebra 2, you're in Algebra 2. Should, should remind you of Algebra 1. Our set notation, we're just going to add our fanciness around it. So we're going to do a squiggly bracket, like I said practice helps your squiggly brackets look good. If you're wondering what in the world a squiggly bracket is supposed to look like, it is the, um, it's on the keyboard to the right of the letter P. It's the top one is the squiggly bracket. So we write a squiggly bracket and then we write X and then we do our vertical line 
that says such that, and then we write our inequality, x is less than 4. And then we close our squiggly bracket. That's a much better squiggly bracket. And then our interval notation. So here's the deal. We're, we're talking about the thing on the left of our interval notation is going to be what's the farthest left number that could be a part of this interval, and the number that's on the right of our interval notation will be what's the farthest number to the right it could be. So the fact that there's a dot on 4 means that one of those two numbers is going to be 4. And so we just need to figure out, well, what's the number that's farthest left that it can be? Which is a trick question because since we have an arrow pointing to left, we could theoretically have negative infinity um, as a part of our interval if we could ever get to negative infinity. So our number on the left, our number on the left is going to be negative infinity to show that it can go left forever. And our number on the right is going to be 4. And the way we decide parentheses or brackets is based on whether we're equal to or not. So for 4, we are not equal to, and it needs a parentheses. We always use parentheses with infinity or negative infinity. Uh, mostly, I think, because of the idea that you can't actually be equal to negative infinity. So it's not like we're saying that you can be. Like say, putting a bracket around negative infinity implies that you can get to negative infinity. But the biggest negative number you can think of, you can always go more negative. So you can't truly get there, which is why we have a parentheses there. Uh, so there's parentheses on each side of this. Let's look at this graph on the right. So here we have negative 8, and it's going to the right. So we're saying that x can be greater than or equal to negative 8. And our set notation is just going to be the fancy version of that uh, much better squiggly bracket. x such that x is greater than or equal to negative 8. And then our interval notation, now our farthest left number is negative 8 where our farthest right number, we don't have a farthest right number, it can go all the way to positive infinity, so that's what we're going to put. We are equal to at negative 8, so I'm going to put a square bracket around negative 8, and then my infinity is going to get a parentheses. We're going to do another set of examples to see if we've got the hang of this. So in, the, in that last set of graphs, we had what's called an open interval because either on toward the left or to the right, we went on forever. So it's open because we could we basically have an infinite number of things that we're talking about. Whereas in this one, these are both going to be closed intervals because while there's still, I guess, technically an in, infinite number of, of things in between our interval, it's a, it's, we have a boundary on each side. That's what's making it close, that there's a boundary on each side instead of it being able to go forever in one direction or the other. So let's look at inequalities. These are both and inequalities, by the way, if you try to remember back to Algebra 1, the fun of compound inequalities. Oh, those are the good old days. So in this one, this first one, we've got negative 6 and 6. We've got uh, closed circles, which means we're equal to. And so whenever it's an and, what we do is we put the x in the middle. We use less than and equal to signs for, for both of these, like this. And then we put the numbers we're talking about, negative 6 and then 6. And I think that we uh, can often struggle with this idea that those are both supposed to be less than signs whenever we might feel like one of them should be a greater than sign. Because if we write it separately, we would say that x is greater than or equal to negative 6, and x is less than or equal to positive 6. But when we write it together with the x in the middle, we're having to flip this around, and so it flips the inequality. The other way of, of looking at this inequality is to say, x is in the middle, and so when we read the left part, we'd actually think x, and then the bigger sides towards x, so we're actually saying x is greater than or equal to negative 6 because we're, like, reading to the left. Um, I'm not sure if that makes sense to you, but if you just want to memorize <laughs> that in inequality notation, when you have x in the middle of two numbers, they should always be less than symbols. That's also a strategy that works. Our set notation just adds our fanciness, a squiggly bracket, x 
vertical line, and then our inequality. And then we close with the squiggly bracket. Our interval notation, this is why I really like interval notation, because all we need is those two numbers, negative 6 and 6. We make sure that the number that's on the left side of the number line is on the left of our interval notation, right is on the right. We do pay attention to whether it's equal to or not, since these are both equal to. We put a bracket around both, and voila, that's our interval notation. If you're wondering, like, how do we tell the difference between interval notation and points now because points you know have an x comma y with parentheses um, we it's the context around the situation that tells us what's going on that usually if it if it's amb an ambiguous situation where you could think of it either way they should use the word interval which tells you it's an interval not a point um, but you should you should get the hang of when when they're talking about intervals and when they're talking about points it we end up talking a lot more about intervals than regular points, I think, the farther we get into math. So this second one here, negative 5 and 0, we're going to write inequalities for. So we have x in the middle. This is a less than or equal to for the left because it's a filled in circle. But on the right, it's an open circle, so that's going to be a regular less than. The negative 5 goes on the left, and the 0 goes on the right. If something about this isn't making sense to you, find a friend to ask, um, an older sibling, a parent, uh, or, or leave a comment about what you're struggling with and I will do my best to get back to you um, because just because you're watching a, a video and I can't actually answer your questions doesn't mean that I can't answer your questions. I, if you leave a comment, I can actually do my best to answer them. So for interval notation here, we're going to use the negative 5 and the 0, and then we have to think, okay, which one's equal to and which one's not? Negative 5 is equal to, so it gets a bracket. 0 is not equal to, so it gets a parenthesis. Make sure that you don't do that thing, which I also have been guilty of doing, where it's like, oh, I wrote a parenthesis, but I meant to write a bracket, so let me just write over it. You think your teacher knows whether you meant parenthesis or bracket when it looks like that? Because they don't. So make sure that just in general, you should erase before writing over, or erase instead of writing over something if you make a mistake. But definitely in that case, uh, you should take the time to erase so that your teacher knows what you're trying to say. Now that we've talked about how to write intervals, we're going to get to actually the heart of this lesson, which is talking about domain, range, and, and behavior. And let me tell you, as a math teacher who has, has taught basically all of the math classes you can take in high school all the way up to calculus if you like i did in school are like i kind of get domain and range but not really but it probably is fine i'll just try to fake it and i'm sure it'll be fine i'll never see it again and then you just keep seeing it again it is worth it to try to understand it as soon as possible versus saying i can just kind of get it and you know let the rest of the concepts on this test or whatever uh, make up for the fact that I don't really get domain and range. And, and knowing that, I'm going to do my best to really explain it in, in a way that will make sense. Um, so in this particular uh, set of words that I've got, this paragraph, it says recall. So this is something that you probably went over in Algebra 1. It says recall the domain of a function is its set of input values, also known as x, and the range of a function is a set of output values, either known as y or this uh, f parentheses x, which we read f of x. So this may be new, it may not be new, but the end behavior of a function describes what is happening to the graph of the function as the x values increase or decrease toward positive infinity or negative infinity. There's this cool thing that happens with graphs where as you put in uh, bigger and bigger numbers that graphs tend to do something. That there are some that just kind of go up and down like crazy. Um, but in general, most of our graphs, as you increase your x value or decrease your x value, your y value should also either increase or decrease or head toward a certain number. 
And this is the concept of in-behavior. And it's called in-behavior because we don't actually necessarily care what's in the middle of our graph. We care about what's happening on the ends of our graph. So we're going to look at some examples where we identify the domain range and in-behavior of some graphs. So again, I said I was going to say it again, but again, download the notes page so that you have these cool graphs that you can make notes on because it's a really good idea. All right, this first graph looks interesting. It is a smiley face. So uh, this was just supposed to be a, a fun graph and, and we don't actually necessarily have a smiley face graph. We could graph circles. That's a thing we can graph. Um, and so the it says write the domain and range using each of our notations. We are going to do that, but in behavior doesn't really work on this because the graph is contained to the middle there is no end behavior. It doesn't increase towards infinity or negative infinity. So for this one, we are not going to have to write end behavior. There is no end behavior. Now, when we look for our domain, we're looking at what are the x values. What is the farthest left that my graph can go? And what is my farthest right that my graph can grow, go? And also the idea of does it actually hit that point or is it that it's going right up to the point, but not actually hitting it? So I would say that for our domain, we are equal to on, it looks like, negative 3 and 3. So for our inequality notation, we'll use negative 3 is less than or equal to x, which is less than or equal to 3. Our set notation, remember, is just a little fancier. My child's fine, I promise. Oh, it's so heavy. Good job. And then our interval notation, since it's equal to, we do square brackets, negative 3, comma, 3, like so. Our range is talking about the y values. So instead of using x's in our inequality and set notation, we're going to want to use y values and we're going to want to use the letter y. And as we um, decide how high it is and how low it is, okay, here's how high it is at positive 3. Here's how low it is. Okay, let's pretend like it touches at negative 3 because I'm, I intended it to, to touch at negative 3, even though it doesn't look like it quite touches. Um, the idea of the idea of these uh, not touching at a point, um, that tends to happen um, when we have these things called asymptotes, that it should be hopefully kind of obvious uh, when it's not touching something when it's just going up to it. Or we could have an open circle that shows us that it's getting right up next to it but not touching it. So this is also negative 3 is less than or equal to, but it's y. And then use our fancy notation. So I wrote y twice on accident. This is supposed to be a 3. So this is negative 3 is less than or equal to y is less than or equal to 3. With our closed bracket. And then our interval is going to look the same as it did for domain, negative 3, comma, 3, with square brackets. Like I said, there's no end behavior here because our graph is, doesn't have arrows making it show that it continues to the left or to the right. So we will see some end behavior, though, on hopefully the next graph. Okay, so here is a nice good old line that we're going to find the domain and range of, as well as the end behavior. And so for our domain, one of the ways that we can figure out our domain is to say, instead of thinking, what can x be, of thinking, is there something x can't be? So for instance, I can have an x value of 2 on this graph that gives me a point here. I can have an x value of 8. I can have an x value of negative 10. While my graph is only so big, I could theoretically extend the line as long as I wanted and still have more x values happening. And in fact, because of our arrows at the end of our line showing that it goes on forever, that means our domain is actually 
all real numbers. It can be anything from negative infinity to positive infinity. So you can actually kind of say this a few different ways. You can write inequalities with infinity. I don't know that I necessarily care for that personally, but it is a thing you can do. This is another reason why I like interval notation better, because I think this looks a little silly. Um, the other thing you could do is we could say that our domain is all real numbers, because we're saying it can be anything, um, any decimal, any fraction, any number from negative infinity to positive infinity. For interval notation, we're going to say negative infinity and positive infinity. We're going to use parentheses because we always use parentheses with negative infinity and positive infinity because we can't be equal to negative infinity and infinite and infinity. It's not an actual number, it's a concept. And you can't be equal to a concept in the same way you can be equal to a number. For our range, we're talking about our y values, and we also have uh, this situation where it's going up and down forever. And so our range is actually the same thing, just instead of having x's, we would have y's. Negative infinity is less than y is less than infinity. Uh, squiggly bracket y such that negative infinity is less than y is less than infinity. And then negative infinity comma infinity. Now we're going to talk about the end behavior. And there are a variety of ways that we can write end behavior. Most of the ways that we write end behavior involves us using notation where we have x and an arrow. That's supposed to be an arrow. It's, it at one point looked good and then it just went sideways. Um, x and an arrow and an infinity and then x and an arrow and negative infinity, saying that x as we go towards positive infinity. So as our x value moves to the right, what is our y value doing? Uh, and then as our x is going to the left towards negative infinity, what is our function doing? But we're going to do some fanciness here, and we're going to write these as what's called a limit. And this is going to get us ready for pre-calculus and calculus where limits become a thing. So to write a limit, you write LIM up above this x arrow infinity. And then we're going to write f of x just to say, OK, the limit as x goes to infinity of our function. Can I take this monster truck? Yes, you can take this monster truck. Uh, and then it equals, and we're going to say what it equals. So as our graph goes to the right, what is our y value doing? Is our y value going up, or is it going down? Or is it headed towards a particular number? Well, you can see that the line is going down and to the right. So that means that as our x goes towards positive infinity, our y goes towards negative infinity. And then we're going to do the same thing for going to the left. We have limit of x as it goes to negative infinity of our function, which we're calling f of x. And so as we go left, what is our y doing? Is it going up or is it going down or is it headed to a particular number? Well, it's going up and to the right. So our limit as x goes to the left towards negative infinity is that our function is going up towards positive infinity. Uh, there are other ways of writing end behavior. You can use words to describe it. You can say as x increases, y decreases or as x decreases, y increases. You can also use uh, arrows and x's and y's um, without the limit notation. But if you are headed towards a pre-calculus and AP calculus sort of situation, getting uh, familiar with this limit notation will be super helpful. And at some point in time, I'm going to do a video about limits and what they're talking about. And so if you're interested in that, as soon as I have that made, it'll pop up right now so that you can head there and see that video if you're interested. OK, our uh, this graph is a parabola. So in Algebra 1, most of the time is spent on lines and parabolas. And now we're talking about, we've talked about a line, now we're talking about a parabola. So uh, we're definitely using our prior knowledge here. 
So for our domain, we are looking at left and right. And part of, part of it is because we only are actually seeing a snapshot of our graph, right? And so we actually have to think beyond the graph. Is there something that at some point of our graph will keep us from going left or right? Um, it also can be helpful. We don't have the equation here, but this has something to do with an x squared, right? And so thinking about is there any number that I can't square, any real number that I can't square and get an answer? Well, you can square any number you want to. You can square 10,000, you can square a million. Squaring a number, there's no issues there. What I mean by that is different than um, square roots. You can't square root negative numbers and get real answers. So a square root graph would have a domain issue because we can't plug in every single number and get something. So for a parabola here, we can go left and right forever. So our domain is going to be that negative infinity to positive infinity like we had for our line. And in fact, if you, it kind of depends on what section of math you're in. Uh, that's not what I wanted to write. Kind of depends on, on like where you are in your math class. But if you are <laughs> at this point, like unsure of what to put, guessing negative infinity to positive infinity, I need to pay attention to what I'm writing. Guessing this is probably one of the better things you could, could guess if you're just not sure what the answer is. Not that you should guess. But so just like the last one, our domain is from negative infinity to positive infinity, but our range here is different because there are y values that are simply not a part of this blue graph that's a parabola. There is there are y values that we just we simply cannot get. You can't get something comma zero, something comma five. These these points up here are just not a part of our graph. The highest point of our graph is actually this negative one. Uh, this point zero comma negative one is our vertex, if you remember that word from algebra one, and it's our, our highest point here. And so for our range, we can basically have any number down to negative infinity, but our highest number that we can get to is negative one. So as an inequality, that means y is less than or equal to negative 1. You can still technically write it, uh, well, don't put that equals there. You can still technically write it this way. I think that's writing more than you need to, but it's not technically wrong, so you can write it that way. And here's how our set notation would look. And then I see people switch this around for interval notation a lot. It's one of the common mistakes of interval notation. Your number on the left is always the, the number that is closer to negative infinity. So since this, we're talking about negative infinity to negative 1, the negative infinity has to go first. Um, not second. Negative infinity, if you're using it in an interval, will always be on the left side, never on the right side. Then we put negative 1, and we put a bracket because we're equal to negative 1. Now, here is our end behavior. And this is going to look a little, a little bit different than the last one, because where our line went up one direction and down the other direction, this parabola, when you go right and when you go left, in both cases, what's our graph doing? It's going down towards negative infinity. So we, I'm going to write out my notation that I am needing to memorize if I haven't already. So our limit as x approaches positive infinity of f of x, as we go to the right, our graph is going down. So this is negative infinity. And then our limit as x goes to negative infinity. So as we go to the left, our graph is going down as well. So the answer to both of these is negative infinity. OK, so this one, again, like our first one, actually does not have end behavior because, again, it, it stops on either side. But I wanted to make the domain and range more interesting. And so, you know, our domain. We want to look at this. Since it, our graph stops on the left and the right, 
those are the two numbers we're going to use. And you can see I've got an open circle at negative 2. So that's signifying that at negative 2, we are not equal to. And over here at positive 2, we actually are equal to because we've got a filled in circle. So our inequality should look like this. Our set notation, of course, looks super similar. And our set notation, we need a parentheses for negative 2 since it's not equal to. But we need a bracket for positive 2 because it is equal to. Our range, for whatever reason, I think range we have a harder time visualizing sometimes. We want to look at what is the highest y value we've got, which is right here at 3. And what is our lowest y value, which is negative 3. I know it kind of looks like it goes past, but... Um, let's make it easy on ourselves and assume that it's negative 3 and positive 3. The negative 3, of course, needs to come first because it is the, the value that's lower on our graph. Um, I think one of the reasons why we maybe sometimes mix that up is because we read from top to bottom, not bottom to top. So, um, set notation. And interval notation, they'll both have brackets because they both are equal to. And so that didn't have anything, the range doesn't have anything to do with these two points that mattered for our domain. So those are, they're kind of two separate things. Sometimes, yes, they go together because of um, the end point being maybe our lowest or highest point, but it's not necessarily something that is true. This final question I have here says, that for the given function and domain, draw the graph and identify the range using the same notation as the given domain. Um, so this lesson, which I on the front says 1.1, this goes with a textbook that I will give that information in the description. Um, so I keep in mind that those exam these examples were intended to be followed by a particular homework assignment from that particular textbook. But if you came here because you just needed help on interval notation or domain and range, uh, your book might have, your textbook, whatever you're using, hopefully will have some examples or practice. And eventually, someday, when I get around to it, I'll be sure to uh, have some, some resources to go with this as well. So we are supposed to graph this from negative 3 to 6, which... This is a line, right, in slope-intercept form. It may be a while since you've graphed a line, so let's remember that negative. we need <laughs> to use the negative 2 as our y-intercept. So I'll put that right here. And then our one-third here is our slope, so we'd go up 1 and over 3. And this is how we graph it, but keep in mind our domain is negative 3, 6. So here where I've got this point, that's as far left as I need to go actually, then I need to make it go right until I get to six. But at six, I don't have a bracket, so I need to put an open circle. Um, and so my line needs to go like this, and I'm not gonna put an arrow on either side because it just wanted me to do negative three with an equal to to six with a not equal to. And so this is my whole graph that I have. Now the range, for this, what is our lowest value here, which is down at this point, so negative 3, and it can be equal to at that point. And then what is our highest value? What is, what is this value right here? That's 0, but it's not equal to. So that's, oh, I, I only had to use the one notation. It says using the same notation as the domain. So I only actually needed to use interval notation. Whoop whoopsie, that thing I said not to do where you write over when you make a mistake, I just did that. But it looks so good, doesn't it? That's why you erase. I'm going to do it. I'm going to erase. Oh. And then rewrite it. Here we go. Ta-da! So our range is from negative 3 to 0, bracket around negative 3 because we're equal to, parentheses around 0 because we are not equal to. Thanks so much for watching. If you are interested in more resources and more math stuff, you can go to my website, which is up on the screen, probably like up here above my head. 
I also will put a link in the description so you can go to this particular lesson and see if there's any resources about it in particular. And if you didn't already notice, my three-year-old is um, around while I'm recording this, so hopefully you've enjoyed that and hopefully it wasn't too distracting. If you want to support me in some way, subscribing is super helpful, liking, get, leaving a comment, all of those things help YouTubers out, so feel free to do that. And I will catch you in the next video. Thanks.